Hi everybody. Today we are going to talk about viruses. So <clears throat> what exactly is a virus? That's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover how a uh, what a virus is and how a virus works. So here you can see um, some <clears throat> different diagrams that show you the size of a virus. So here is a eukaryotic a human red blood cell compared to a bacteria. And all of these little things here, um, these little dots are actually the viruses. <clears throat> so if we zoom in and then zoom in again, we can see that viruses are actually incredibly, incredibly tiny. So we're talking about very, very small things. <clears throat> so is a virus living? and what characteristics are necessary for something to be considered living. So viruses are a non-living parasite. We don't consider them to be fully living. <clears throat> viruses are a biological enigma. They have some characteristics of living organisms, but we don't consider them living. They are like living organisms because they uh, have genetic material. It's either DNA or RNA. They can mutate. They can evolve, they can replicate, and they can interact with other organisms. However, they are not like living organisms because they actually are derived from the cells of other things. And they can only reproduce when they use a host cell. They don't have their own metabolism and they don't really respond to any stimuli. So they are not really considered alive. <clears throat> so we are gonna call a virus an obligate intracellular parasite. So that is a parasite that has to use other cells in order to reproduce and survive. Viruses can only replicate within a host cell. The structure of a virus is pretty simple. There is genetic material in the middle. You see that there. There is a capsid. A capsid is basically a protein coat. So there's protein surrounding it. And then there are these spikes. These are recognition spikes. Our immune system can actually recognize these spikes to help fight them off. Um, or they can actually, viruses can use these spikes in order to sort of trick cells into going in. So these spikes are a pretty important part of the virus's structure. Some viruses have a lipid envelope. So this would be a, like a bilayer. So a an envelope that you would see on a prokaryote or a eukaryote, and the um, spikes are coming off of the lipid envelope. But everything else is the same. There's a nucleic acid in here, and there's a capsid. <clears throat> there are many different shapes of viruses. Viruses are incredibly diverse. We have some viruses here. This is the, the tobacco mosaic virus, a plant virus. We have the adenovirus influenza. And then we have this weird looking thing, which is a bacteriophage. That is a virus that infects a bacteria. You might remember this from the Hershey and Chase experiment we did earlier. All right. So there are all these different types of viruses and we can see the difference in their shapes and sizes. There's so many different types, parvo, influenza, all kinds of different um, structures to viruses. So although viruses are not considered living things, we still um, are able to classify them. But it's kind of difficult to classify them definitively because they're so tiny and their genomes are really, really tiny. They mutate so quickly and we can't find fossils of them because they're so small and because they are so diverse. Many of them don't seem to be related at all. So instead of using phylogenies, <clears throat> viruses are placed in one of several groups based on the structure of their genomes. Are they RNA or DNA? Viruses can have either. Remember, they're not living things totally. So some of them can have RNA as their genetic material. Are they double-stranded or are they single-stranded? RNA viruses may have been cellular components involved in basic cellular functions and they might have escaped at one point in the past. Scientists speculate that single-stranded RNA genomes may have been common in the distant past so long, long ago before DNA became the primary molecule of heredity. So we're talking about these RNA viruses might have escaped long ago 
and then evolved since then. <clears throat> RNA viruses sometimes will use a self, um, no, I'm sorry, a um, RNA virus could be a, a self-replicating <clears throat> RNA polymerase gene that began to replicate on its own. And as it began to replicate on its own, it might have started associating that replication with protein coding genes. So it could have come from that. So what types of RNA viruses are there? There is a single stranded RNA virus. So a single stranded RNA virus is going to be um, one strand of RNA. In this case, RNA is going to be a complement for mRNA. <clears throat> so basically the single stranded RNA viruses are then gonna be needed to make mRNA and what can we do with mRNA? We can use mRNA to make proteins. Now, some single-stranded RNA viruses don't need to make mRNA because they are going to act like their own mRNA. So some single-stranded RNA viruses are actually just going to go right to the translation step without the transcription. So some of these single-stranded RNA viruses need to be transcribed into mRNA, and some single-stranded RNA viruses are already going to be the mRNA, and they're simply going to be translated. <clears throat> a retrovirus is a type of RNA virus that's going to uh, do something a little bit interesting. Um, an example of this is HIV, <clears throat> and um, a retrovirus is an RNA virus that's going to use its RNA to make DNA. Now, <clears throat> RNA to DNA, that is like the opposite of transcription. So most cells can't do that. So a retrovirus like HIV will have to include its own enzyme called reverse transcriptase, or the opposite of transcription, going from DNA to RNA. So <clears throat> here we have to take the RNA, turn it into DNA, and then that single-stranded DNA can simply replicate itself to make double-stranded DNA. And then what the virus will do is it will take that double-stranded DNA and it will put it into the host genome. So here we have our virus. There's RNA inside. The RNA is going to use reverse transcriptase to make DNA. The DNA is going to replicate itself. And then it's going to hide in the host genome. And that is exactly what HIV does. The DNA hides in the host genome. It can actually wait there for a while before it starts to infect other cells. All right, a double-stranded RNA virus um, probably evolved from its single-stranded ancestors, or maybe it happened the other way around. It's very hard to tell. So a double-stranded RNA virus. We also have DNA viruses. DNA viruses can be either single-stranded. Single-stranded DNA viruses um, are going to be able to make RNA pretty easily, and so are double-stranded DNA viruses. <clears throat> so um, viruses can follow any one of those pathways, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, or either one of these DNA viruses. DNA viruses might have evolved as reduced parasites that lost their cellular structure as well as their ability to survive freely. So basically, it's hypothesized that DNA viruses are not really related to RNA viruses at all. Instead, they were some sort of parasite that basically lost most of their form, are incredibly reduced, and are now unable to live outside of a, outside of a host. It appears that uh, viruses have evolved many times in the history of life from many different organisms, and this could be why viruses might only infect certain living things like a certain species of plant or a certain species of animal or a bacteria, because those viruses might have evolved from ancestors of those things. So it may be best to think of viruses as spin-offs from the various branches of the tree of life. Here are, here's another picture of various viruses and their different shapes, Ebola, a bacteriophage, cowpox, 
<clears throat> and the final thing we're going to talk about today is the life cycle of a virus. It's actually pretty simple. And there are two different variations of this. There's the lysogenic cycle, and then there is the lytic cycle. So what are these two cycles? To help us understand, we're going to look at a picture. So the lytic cycle is on the left, and it's pretty straightforward. So we're going to look at this cycle from the perspective of a bacteria and a bacteriophage. The bacteriophage binds to the bacteria. It injects its DNA. And the DNA will digest the host cell DNA. The host cell DNA is going to be done for. So the virus is going to use the cell's own equipment to replicate its own DNA. So the viral DNA is taking over. The viral DNA has genes to make more viruses. Those viruses get assembled and then they will lyse the cell, they will burst out, and they will go and infect other cells, and the whole cycle starts again. So the lytic cycle is a cycle of infecting, killing the cell, infecting other cells. The lysogenic cycle on the right is a um, cycle of weight. So lysogenic is slower. So in this case, the bacteriophage still will infect the cell, and inject its DNA, but instead of chopping up the host cell DNA, what the virus is going to do is it's going to incorporate itself into the host chromosome. It will make what's called a prophage, and the prophage is just going to wait there. It's going to do nothing. The cell will divide on its own, inadvertently dividing the prophage as well, and it will divide and divide and divide many times until some environmental factor like stress or an environmental change causes the prophage to come out of the chromosome. And so what happens then? The cell moves from the lysogenic cycle to the lytic cycle. So the lysogenic cycle is a wait, sort of like a sneaky waiting process before the virus actually begins its viral activity. So that is the life cycle of a virus. <clears throat> All right, and that is where we are going to stop. Um, if you have any questions, um, please let me know.